from being little, I always went racing with my dad. Um, you know, I always went and spectated a lot at Mallory Park, and it was a, a dream to always to always go racing. That was what you wanted to start doing. Um, and um, I was training as a civil engineer, and where I was working on the on the M5 being built, um, the Hereford County Council, one of the guys I worked with had built himself a Morris Minor Classic Saloon. Um, and uh, he did one race in it and didn't like it. So I decided that I should try and buy that and that this Morris Minor was going to be my uh, career path to a Formula One Grand Prix drive. <laughs> so I, I bought it off him and um, sort of rebuilt it as much as I knew about cars at the time and, and went and did my first ever race at Aintree. So yeah, which was an amazing thing. So I, I drove the car there, yeah, uh, completely clueless, you know, didn't have any it sounds bad if you say I didn't have any mates, but I didn't have anybody to go with me. Um, my dad was sort of not too keen on the idea. My mum died when I was very, very young, and he, he thought me going motor racing was not such a, such a great idea. There was only the two of us. Um, so I drove it to Aintree with a little toolbox and a, a, a jerry can in there, did the classic saloon race, and um, finished, thought it was amazing, and then drove home, and promptly ran out of fuel on the M6 because I'd sort of miscalculated how much fuel it used. So I did classic saloons in Morris Minor for a couple of years. Then I thought, well, if you're ever going to try and move on as a, as a career in racing, you've got to be doing Formula Ford. So I went to the bank again and borrowed some more money, as everybody does as they're starting off like that. And I bought what was Andy Wallace's championship winning pre-74 Formula Ford and did a couple of years in that. Couldn't really afford to do it. And it was a typical Formula Ford story that you'd do a couple of races, you'd do well, you'd have an accident, you couldn't afford to repair it. You know, you just, uh, my mother-in-law was great because she was always lending me a bit of money to fix it when you can get back out there. And ironically, I'd, I'd met somebody through the racing that ran a, ran a garage and he'd asked me, because I was doing all my own preparation on my cars, and so he asked me, would, it, would I go and work for him and run his garage for him, which was quite a decent, decent size. It was TBR garage, um, and he was actually one of the partners in the resurrection of the Lister Jaguar name. So it was Ian Exeter, um, there, were three, there were three guys, there was Ron Beattie from Ford Engineer and there's Ian Exeter and John Lewis, and they bought the Lister name from Brian Lister to restart doing the Jaguar XJS listers. What I did then was uh, in, in 1986, my dad died and left me a little bit of, mo a little bit of money. It was, it was a reasonable amount of money, then it was eight grand, yeah? And I'd stopped racing for a while because Judith and I had had our do first daughter, Sarah, um, who was upstairs at the minute doing our books. And I sort of, so I'd stopped racing, I couldn't afford it. One of the guys that I knew from where I, where I was working, raced a Porsche. Raced a Porsche 911E in what was then the Gyroflex Porsche Championship. Um, he asked me at the end of 86, he said, look, I'm not gonna do the last round of it. He said, I know you still wanna go racing. Why don't you use my car and go and do that? So in those days, most of the Porsche racing, that was the main Porsche series in the, in the country, but most people drove the cars there. So Judith and I, I borrowed it off him. I drove it there. Um, I won the race at Brands Hatch. And I took it back to him on the Monday and he said, well, it is for sale, you know, if, if, you, if you sort of fancied doing a bit more of it. So I said to him, Nick Taylor it was, I said, Nick, how, how much do you want for it? He said, I want eight and a half grand for it. So I'm standing there with this crisis of confidence that in my pockets, eight grand that my dad's just left me from passing. He wants eight and a half grand for this car. We haven't got a lot of money and we've got no sponsorship or anything. And Judith said, look, you should just buy it. Just buy the car and see where it leads us in life. So I bought it and um, we raced it the next year in the Pirelli Porsche Championship, which we won. Um, won nine out of 12 rounds that year and three seconds. And that was really the start of me then going out on my own. So at the end of 87, I'd won that. And I had a couple of people from the Porsche series ask me if I'd start preparing their cars. So I started my business then, which was Eurotech. I started that and ran that until uh, 2014. So did a lot of Porsche racing. Um, so I was still racing, but preparing cars for my customers. Went and got some premises, um, and moved up the ranks a little bit and did GT racing. And, and you know, we won British GT in a GT3 R, same same model car as he sat behind me here. Um, we went and raced one at Daytona. I was lucky enough when I was driving TVRs to drive at Le Mans. So it was it was a fantastic time. It was a big adventure. I had a go-kart when I was eight um, and enjoy, you know, I, I used to go, we used to go testing and I'd always be quite competitive and, and in, in enjoyed it. Um, 
And then I went and did my first race and dad couldn't be there. So um, someone else took me and, and I, I didn't really enjoy it. I got a bit beat up by the regulars, uh, not physically on the track. And, um, and I just didn't really enjoy it. And he didn't want to be a pushy dad. You know, you, you see a lot of the time, I, I saw back then that a karting, not all karting dads, but it, it was quite full on. Um, but I was probably quite lucky in the sense that my dad had done his race and he didn't have to try and do it through me sort of thing. So um, he just said, look, we'll, we'll sell it. If you don't want to do it, we'll sell it, no problem. But you come to me when, if you want to do anything again, he kind of left the ball in my court. So then um, when I was 14, I went to him and had really got the urge to do something uh, myself. And then he'd probably been waiting because then it was all in, um, in, in rallycross. So junior rallycross were kind of 50 horsepower minis then. Um, and my aim was, probably because I'd had a bad experience at my kart race racing people, it was to go rallying. That was, that was what I wanted to do. I, right, I want to go and um, I want to be a rally driver. And um, dad from the get-go said, look, that's, getting into racing and being professional is very hard anyway. You know, sponsorship is the hardest thing. It's probably even a bit harder to get sponsorship in rallying because of the environment, you, environment you're in sort of thing. So, um, I knew that from, from the get-go, but we saw Rallycross was a good way to learn car control. And Rallycross was great because you had loads of races per day. So as a learning exercise, it was, it was very good. Um, we brought a car and I, I won my first race, which probably then sped up the, well, I'm, I might be half decent at this. Then let's, let's take it seriously. Then we, we built our own car um, and we took it seriously from the get-go. You know, he, he did a lot of Rallycross and then then moved into circuit racing as soon as he could at 16. At the time, Dad was in touring cars, all sponsor funded, all very well sponsor funded. So, and, and they'd kind of said it would be really cool to do a father and son touring car scene. So it, it was weird because you speak to some people that oh, I've always wanted to do touring cars. And for me, I wanted to do European rallycross. I, I wanted to be a professional rallycross driver, which at the time was pretty much unheard of. There was only a couple doing it. If you want to make a profession of it you need to go circuit racing and, and in a lucky position we had the funding from the sponsors there to do that so did one year in um, or kind of a half season really in Renault Clio's and then, then straight into touring cars at, at 18 which was uh, was good fun was was a real eye-opener but as an 18 year old lad in touring cars was brilliant I didn't really have much stress that year because I didn't I wasn't involved in operating the team I worked there but um, yeah, he, he had a lot more stress than I did that year, that's for sure. Yeah. I, I think I was growing at the same time as the team was growing. Obviously in 2008, we ran it as a family team. Um, and then I went and drove for, for Vauxhall in 2009 and probably learnt the hard way. I was up against uh, teammates with Fabrizio Giovinardi and, and Matt Neal, which was an eye opener on just how good they were on their bad weekends, which was a real learning thing for me. So then um, went back to Eurotech then, um, we decided that we need to do it in-house financially really for, for our sponsors. For, it, it all evolved really nicely as I was learning as a driver, so it was, uh, yeah, it was good fun. Really, really nice years to, to do it, if I'm honest. The business model shifted for us, where we'd had a big workshop looking after cars in British GT. We, we did the Ascari with the Joneses in British GT. We did a Mercedes SLS. We did a lot of stuff like that, but I knew that we'd be spread too thinly if we were ever going to seriously challenge in BTCC. So I'd progressively worked hard to get more sponsorship on board for our touring car exploits and dropped off the customer work. So that at, the, at our pinnacle in 2012, when I knew we were ready to really go all in at that, I'd stopped driving then in touring cars because I just thought you can't, I couldn't run the team and drive and manage Andrew and I just knew what I wanted to do was for him to try and win it. We'd really stretched ourselves financially to purchase the Hondas, um, which Team Dynamics had built. And uh, that was again a learning year, a kind of next step as me as a driver and us as a team. But 2013, it just clicked. We probably, all of us, the guys, my engineer, me, had a kind of, not arrogance in a bad way, but knew we could challenge for it. And we went into it that mentality. It was brilliant. It was. A group of mates dominating the season that year. We, we you know, we did, we, we, we dominated them that year. Um, just having fun with it, beating the works teams with their own car, which got awkward at times. Um, 
and, and winning the British, you know, the British Touring Car Championship as a, a group of mates out of a really small workshop. Um, wouldn't have had the biggest budget, wouldn't have had the smallest budget, but we applied it in the right, right areas and um, spent every penny we had that year. You know, it, it was when we went to the finale with a chance of winning it. I remember the bills coming in on new drive shafts, new gearbox bits. It, it was, you sometimes get one chance to, to win a championship like that. So yeah, we, we spent every penny we had to, to, to win it, which um, is what you've got to do. But straight away when I, uh, I rolled out in 2014, which started really well, you know, we had pole and two wins at the first one. But I, I just felt there was that expectation that it was almost, if you weren't winning, what was wrong? And halfway through 14, I said to Andrew and my wife, I don't want to stay in BTCC forever and a day, trying to achieve what we've achieved once and going up against huge works budgets. Yeah. You're still having to raise a lot of money from your sponsor. You know, it's still, it costs half a million quid to run a car in British Touring Cars. And so you're raising a lot of money and I don't want to keep going and not be able to do it again. At that point, Jeff Smith, who was in our customer car, he wanted to own a touring car team. So we basically did a deal and I sold Eurotech as our touring car team to Jeff. So he wanted to, he wanted to be a team owner. At that point, I knew that the future for us was in historic racing. It had, I'd been doing a little bit of historic racing in the two previous years from that. We built our Austin A40, which was our, you know, Racy Rose, it was, it, she'd done a lot at Goodwood, and I knew that's where I wanted to go. I drove a Morris Minor at Goodwood Revival. I think it would have been 2012 or 13, which really got that I hadn't really seen much of the Revival up until then. Because you're all touring cars, yeah. you, you're just like this, you don't look at anything else. And then I was like, bloody hell, like, this, is, this is cool. Um, and so that really then amped up the right, let's get a car and, and hopefully we can get an invite. So about, ooh, uh, about 12, something like that, I'd bought an A40, you know, a, just a, a standard road car that I thought that's, that's quite fun. That's exactly, exactly right. This is what my dad had and I'll, I'll, I'll have that at home. Andrew had done a race, at, he'd done a race at Goodwood in um, Morris Minor. Um, and the guys that own that, um, Mark Cross, um, they asked me if I fancied a race in it which I did. That was probably, probably in 13. And I came away and it was, it was almost going back full circle because I'd started racing the Morris Minor in pre-57 saloons in 1979 and here we were in 2013, you'd done it. And I came back and I thought, right, that's what we've got to do. So I drove my A40 into work, I put it on the ramp and I started stripping it on the Sunday. And when my guys turned up on the Monday, I said, what are we doing? I said, I'm going to turn this into a race car. I said, because I think if we build a nice car and I'd sort of researched it a little bit, and Julius at HRDC, Julius Thurgood at HRDC, I thought if we go and race with Julius and we get a nice car scene out there, we might just get a Goodwood invite. And if we get a Goodwood invite, that'll be fantastic. And that was always my sort of target, that if we could get a car, have some fun racing with Julius, which is always fun racing with Julius, but if we could get a car into Goodwood, it would become a bit of a shop window for us as well. And that's exactly what happened. We did that. Um, we rolled our, our car out at, at, at Goodwood in 14, I think it was, um, and had a couple of our older customers straight away pick up the phone to us. So oh, we see you're doing historic cars. We fancy a Lotus Cortina. Could you do a Cortina for us? And in an instant, you'd got work coming through the door. So it was a dream of ours to, to try and get, get it to revival. But did I see um, that as the start of a, a business? Mm, probably not, because still I was in touring car mode. So that was all I was kind of thinking of and this was just a bit of fun really. So the first car we built for a customer was for Mark Sumter. At the time he didn't do race cars, so he sort of partnered with me and I said, well, I'll do your race car for you, and we just worked together. He was the first person to commit to us for a Lotus Cortina. Um, Pete Chambers, who had been a long time driver with us and a sponsor of, of the team, he then said, well, I fancy one of those as well. They'd almost gone, they'd almost calmed down on their other racing and gone, well, this historics looks quite good. So. It just opened the floodgates a little bit. Um, we then thought, well, okay, if, that's, if there's a big market in Lotus Cortinas, we'll build one ourselves. So I said to Andrew, let's, let's build one and we'll do a couple of races with it. 
which we, we actually did one race with it and had Howard Donald from Take That see, see it and said, right, I'd like to buy that car. So it just, the thing just snowballed along. Um, we got an invite for Goodwood in, in, that, in that Cortina and went very well there as well. So it, it just started from that really. It seems to be we said, had several people that have come to us to have a car built and then we've run it for them and they've enjoyed the experience and it's, oh, well, I'd like one of those. Can you do me one of those? So we've got several guys that have got three, four, five cars with us. To the point now we're, we're and I can't actually believe I'm saying this, we're knocking on the door of having 50, 50 race cars around us, um, which is just monstrous. <laughs> and that was never in the plan. <laughs> we're a, a modern mindset mindset team in the sense that we don't build engines, we don't do our paint, we don't do our in-house fabrication in terms of shells and um, roll cages. We do our little bits of fabrication and machining, but we've got good people that we use for all of that. And I would have no desire to build our own engines in the slightest. And I, I get it, there's, people, there's teams that do and it's great. Like that, that's, that's, but for, for us, we outsource that sort of stuff to very good people. Um, and then we can just focus on the chassis, the build quality, the chassis setup of existing cars. You know, we are never stopping in that sense. You know, you look at the cars that we operate in those areas, there's already very good people that have been going for years and years and years building good engines. So why would we go and say, I oh, know, we're going to try and build our own Cortina engine. No, thanks. I'll pay my money and we'll pay our money. And we'll get the engine delivered when they say it will be delivered and it will perform as they say it will. So it's, um, it, it's, it's just not what we do. And I'd have no desire to do that personally. It is very rare for us to send the car to a test or a race meeting without Andrew or I going along there. So we can both still drive the cars. You know, we've got some great drivers in our, in our historic cars, but it's still very handy that we're both very active in driving. He's a lot more active than I am, but we, we both can do that. He's really bought the whole modern data aspect of it to drive a coach in our historic guys. So if you went any bigger than we did, you'd lose that personal touch. And it, you can't say, oh, well, we're just bringing some other people to do it because we, we try and really, you know, we're good friends with all of our customers as well. So you want to look after them very properly. So I'm quite happy doing what we're doing. As long as we can keep being successful and keep um, winning races and building lovely cars that people are happy with. Just motivates me to keep doing a good job. I don't have any motivation necessarily to keep growing or anything like that. I want it to be a nice environment for people to work in, which is a big thing for me. And I want our clients to be happy and I want us, them to enjoy coming racing with us. But other than that, I don't have any views on, on where we go from there.